You're listening to Improve. Hello, I'm Janine Butchroyd and I am the founder and group CEO of Supporting Minds. Hello, I'm Steve Randall and this is Meet the Coach, where we hear from insightful coaches in well-being, business and life. Well, welcome to the podcast. Now, I want to talk to you about Supporting Minds and also your book. So let's talk about Supporting Minds first of all. What is it exactly and and how does it work? Supporting Minds is essentially an affordable therapy organisation, talking therapy organisation. And I set it up in 2014 because I just recognised that there was a real need within my community in Lincolnshire, but also across the nation, really, that The counselling services that we were accessing were either NHS and they had long waiting lists and they predominantly offered cognitive behavioural therapy or CBT. Um, And that just didn't suit everybody's style or it was private therapy. Now, what you're describing there, a lot of people will say straight away, yeah, I recognise that. And, you know, I have a couple of people in my family who have tried to access help with various things. But as you say, the waiting lists are ridiculous. And, you know, even once you're on on that sort of treadmill, the gap between appointments can make it just crazy because you think, well, it was ages ago when I had my last appointment and you feel like it's all been undone in the time since. So what you're offering is a situation where people pay a relatively low fee Mm -hmm. compared to private therapies, but they access somebody much, much quicker than they would if they were uh, going through the NHS route. And it's it's just another option for people and for people who can afford to do that. It's a good way to get the help that they need a bit quicker. You're right. It it is another option. Um, So we have that affordability element to it but also we don't limit the number of sessions that an individual can attend so if they need six sessions we commit to them for six sessions if they need 30 or 40 sessions we're committed for 30 or 40 sessions so we really do take an individualized approach to our clients and who are the people who are working with you who are the the people who are going to be delivering this therapy to people who need it so we have a wide range of skills and experience within the organization Um, So we're also a training provider. So we train um, individuals to become qualified, ethical and safe counsellors. So we have students within our service who are in the final stages of their training. So they need to have some practical experience to complete their qualification. We also have qualified experience that we employ and they tend to work with the higher risk clients or those clients that maybe have got additional needs or support needs to be put in place for them. So yeah, there's something to suit everybody. And for those who aren't familiar with how talking therapy works, what does it bring to people who are looking for help? I think we're quite backwards in this country in terms of seeking support um, and what that looks like. So I've always wanted supporting minds to be a very proactive service to really um, build our pot of resilience, to understand more about ourselves, develop our self-awareness. So counselling is also a great space to do that. But as you know, with things, especially post-COVID, we're all struggling, including myself, struggling more and more with day-to-day anxiety, stress levels, low mood, and having a safe space away from friends and family that's completely confidential, non-judgmental, just to come and just to air off and just to be at one with yourself is really powerful in itself, let alone obviously the other things that counselling can do in terms of wanting to change patterns of behaviour, working towards goals, um, or maybe just reconnecting with your old self. We've all, and when I say we've all, you know, the world has been through an element of this. Certainly the the fear of getting ill or our friends and loved ones getting ill, um, the lockdown situation, you know, pretty much everybody in the world has experienced that. But when it comes to any issue, an individual will react to it differently. So just because your friends and family may be saying, I'm fine, I'm over it now, I'm moving on. There's no shame and no guilt in feeling, actually, I'm not over this. I, I'm still struggling with this. You know, what's what's happened in the last couple of years is is still causing me anxiety. Oh, yeah, no shame at all. And I think also it's just reconnecting with ourselves and with others and just checking in with, you know, actually, how do I really feel about this? Most of us have all got stuff, you know, pre-pandemic. 
And the pandemic seems to have amplified those issues for us. And I think that's partly due to that isolation um, as well as the traumatic experience that we've all been through. Yeah, and, and of course, some people before the pandemic were perhaps not identifying that they had any sort of issues, but the way that their life was set up was keeping them just about above water. So those people, for example, who absolutely hate the job that they're doing, but when they get to Friday night and they can meet up with their friends, that was the thing that kept them going until Monday morning and then they'd get through the week looking forward to the weekend again. And, and of course, that was taken away from us. And, and meeting it may have been meeting with, with friends or meeting with loved ones. You know, that was taken away from us. So that is traumatic. Definitely. Um, and, yeah, if you cope with mechanism is going out, socialising, having fun, going to the cinema, going for a meal just to take away the stress of the week. And without that, we've all had to relearn new coping mechanisms and some of them are healthier than others. And I think it's, again, being really mindful of no judgment. That's OK. You know, speak to yourself with kindness and compassion. We've all had to do what we've had to do to emotionally survive. And some of us physically survive the pandemic, you know, so this isn't a time of kind of punishing ourselves for the way that um, we've handled the last two years. And when somebody is working with supporting minds and you know, maybe they feel, either they feel or you or one of your uh, team feel that perhaps there's something else that they need, you know, they need to go to the next level or to a slightly different professional. Is is that something that, that happens fairly seamlessly and you say, well, actually, you know, we think that you would need to speak to this person or that type of person? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're very established now, certainly in Lincolnshire, and as we've got new centres across the country, building those community connections with support services and other professionals is something that we're really passionate about because, the client or the individual is the most important person in anything that we do. And if we identify that actually they need to go and see perhaps their GP or a psychiatrist to review some medication or they need to go and see a dietitian or, or something, we will always highlight that to the client as an option. And of course, they then have the choice on whether they choose to follow that through. Now, you've mentioned that you're based in Lincolnshire, but there are other centres that have opened up around the country already. And you're um, expanding with a franchise model, which which people may be interested in. Yes. So September last year, we decided to take the business nationally um, and set up some new centres across the country. And I decided to set up those centres, I suppose, as a bit of a a trial run for the franchise model just to check that I can repeat the model that has worked so well in Lincolnshire because of course each region is different it has a different culture you have different interests and different clients that have different needs and I'm really pleased to say that you know the model has actually been able to be repeated in different areas of course we've had to tweak but that's part of the learning process so now we know that the model absolutely works 100 percent yes now we're starting to push out our franchise model so you can buy into supporting minds and you can have your own supporting mind center now people listening to this are generally very interested in personal development self-awareness self-help self-improvement all of those areas and, and mental health is a big part of that so there may be people listening who are thinking yeah actually this sounds like something that i would like to be involved in what sort of people would you be looking for to be one of your franchisees so we're looking for people that either have a counselling or psychotherapy qualification or a psychologist qualification already. If you don't, then we will be looking for somebody that's got good experience in the health and social care sectors. So aware of safeguarding, um, aware of you know how to build healthy, safe therapeutic relationships with individuals, um, as well as some managerial experience, because you will be managing a team of people. Although, of course, when you first start your business, it might be you and maybe a couple of others but you will be growing quite quickly because our brand is growing quickly excellent so obviously if people are interested they should get in touch with you if they search for supporting minds they'll they'll find your website but if you want to give the the web address that would be good supportingminds.com simple as that and people can go on and find all the information now i mentioned that you had written a book i want to talk about this because i think this very much uh, kind of informs people of of where you're coming from in this whole mental health journey and your book is called healing your own toxicity you say i accepted and acknowledged that i'd surrounded myself subconsciously with toxic people 
to fulfill my toxic needs. Can you explain that? Yes, I think I recognise that I was a codependent individual based on my childhood experiences, some trauma in the past. And therefore, I was seeking out subconsciously relationships and people in my life that were going to continue fueling, you know, some sort of abusive need within me. Um, And it wasn't until I kind of had that light bulb moment of, oh my gosh, this is what you're doing. And this is why your life isn't going how you want it to go. Um, So yeah, it was a very kind of conscious shift in the end of, I have a choice now that I have this awareness. I either make sure that I am becoming more boundaried and I'm being more assertive and I'm speaking up for myself, but I'm also equally respectful of other people and I'm moving away from those people if they're not respectful of me. Mm, You see, this is really interesting because I think we can all identify situations where we've maybe said to a friend or a, a family member, you know, you know, why are you with that person? Or why, why do you hang around with that person? They're no good for you. We've either said it or we've thought it. And if you're not dealing with those sort of situations that you've expressed, you know, that sort of subconscious need to have that toxicity in your life almost, it's very easy to say, well, surely you can just cut that person off and that will be the end of that and you'll, you'll have moved on. But if that's something that even the person who's in that situation doesn't really understand why they keep finding themselves attracted to or involved with these sort of people, it's going to be really, really hard for them to get away from that. You know, even if they get away from the one person their friends are pointing out, they'll just find somebody else who's pretty much the same. Yes. You know, as human beings, we like to repeat patterns because it's safe for us. It's what we know. We might not enjoy it. You know, nobody likes to be in an abusive situation or relationship um, or toxic environment, but there is something that we are getting from it. Um, just because maybe it's familiar and there's a level of safety there. So yes, breaking patterns of behavior, as you say, you might move away from that individual, but what can you do for yourself to make sure that you're breaking the pattern of behavior so you don't repeat it next time around? And without going into your personal situation, I mean, you know, very often this is a case of, I mean, you mentioned trauma in childhood and very often this will come from a point of a parent who, you know, wasn't able to show love in the way that perhaps we would like them to show love. And perhaps there was violence there, perhaps there was abuse, but that subconsciously then becomes tangled up with the idea of what love is and you know that then means that those people will be seeking love as we all do in life but seeking it with that kind of warped sense of what it is yes um again we just kind of we are attracted to the familiar and i think that process of breaking that pattern and that toxic behavior of course we will start blaming our parents or caregivers uh, you know but But actually, we want to get to a place where there is no blame. We are able to maybe understand forgiveness is something else completely. um, But to at least understand why our parents did what they did. Yeah. And I I suppose the, the issue is that, you know, sometimes people have no more contact with that parent or that caregiver. You know, it might have been some, you know, a teacher or whatever who, who had sort of created that situation in them. They they may have no contact with that person. And so that person doesn't know how it's affecting them. So the only person who's being affected long term is the person who's having those feelings. So they can, in some sense, choose. I mean, choose is perhaps not the right word because it makes it sound like it's simple, but they they have a decision to make. Do I continue to carry this pain with me for the rest of my life or do I find a way through it? You know, I'm not going to get a, you know, never going to be able to change what happened, but I will be able to change what happens from here on. You're right. It has to be a conscious decision. And as you've identified, it's painful and it's difficult and it might take years Um, But yes, we can choose whether we want that experience to have a negative impact on our identity or a positive impact, you know, because that is, I suppose, the, the hand that we've been dealt. We can't rewrite history. 
But what we can do is then make a choice about our future and how much we will allow it to impact on us. Can you talk us through um, what toxic behaviour looks like as well? Because I know you, you've, you've got several things that people will immediately go, oh, yeah, I do that. Yeah, so my own... I suppose, toxic behaviour, um, as I mentioned, kind of being codependent. So putting other people's needs before my own, maybe being a bit of a rescuer of making sure that everybody else is happy, making sure that I, um, you know, give my money away or I make sure that somebody else is fed before I eat. You know, those are kind of quite standard things that I think not just women in our society do, but also those that are generally kind of of a more caring um, nature. And also there are some some phrases that sort of leap out at me that I certainly hear people say. Things like, why am I always so unlucky or why does this always happen to me? And that's that whole self-dialogue thing where people are are constantly reinforcing perhaps things that have been said to them in the past, going back to that kind of uh, abuse perhaps in the uh, in their formative years, but then they they reinforce them by saying those things to themselves over and over again. Yes, they do. And one of the most empowering things that I found for myself was being able to separate out what is my true thought process and what have I absorbed from somebody else. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting book. It's called Healing Your Own Toxicity. People can get it on Amazon and, and various other places, I'm sure. And uh, wh- where can people find out more about you generally? I've got a LinkedIn page, Janine Butroyd. The social media channels for Supporting Minds are a really good place of finding out a bit more about me and about my vision for the business going forward. Thanks for listening to Meet the Coach. You can find out more about all of our guests at improveradio.com. Improve Personal Development Radio.